City Council uh, work session, uh, joint meeting with our planning commission um, for April 20th, 2021. And uh, Erica is leading us off. Final draft goals and policies related to healthy and valued ecosystems. Yes. Congratulations, everyone. This is the last block of the comprehensive plan chapters, and then we're moving on to creating the document for everyone to review. So tonight, um, I'm going to just pass the torch on to Anais. I'm going to be running the slideshow and jumping in on some questions when needed. But really, this is your chance to review the information that the CAC and the Planning Commission put together in the draft goals and policies document and for you to have a conversation um, with planning commission and um, the, the planning team here. So with that, let me share my screen. Great, thank you, Erica. Good evening, counselors and planning commission members. Thanks for your time this evening. Um, and as Erica said, the purpose of this joint meeting is to share with you what we've learned and heard and worked through in the last block of the comp plan update. Um, so our planning commission has seen and reviewed this work and tonight's an opportunity um, for you to provide your thoughts and comments and ask us or the planning commission any questions. So um, next slide. Um, this is the final block of our comp plan process. Um, what you're reviewing tonight is a compilation of all of our input and guidance that we've received through all of our TAC and our CAC meetings, um, through the community engagement work, as well as planning commission briefings throughout this block. Um, after this meeting, we'll be ready to move into document production uh, and begin the adoption process in the next month or so. Um, and so, as a reminder, this block covers the topics of parks and recreation, natural resources, watersheds and habitat, and energy. Um, you'll note that one of the biggest topic areas, parks and recreation, um, has already gone through significant work through your new parks and recreation master plan process. Um, so more on that shortly. Um, so healthy and valued ecosystems. Um, as a refresher, we always like to share the visions and the goals that were outlined for this block for the city's 2018 visioning process. Um, so the vision statement says that in 2040, Sherwood will be a leader as a steward of its natural environment. Vegetated corridors are protected and we through the city providing habitat, safe passage for wildlife, clean water and air, and a place for people to connect with nature. The city actively preserves mature trees and natural areas. Four goals accompany that vision statement, and these are the framework for the COP plan update. Um, these goals were also used as the framework for your new parks and recreation master plan. Um, so then a little bit more on your PRMP and how that uh, interfaces with the COP plan update. Um, as noted, uh, the Parks and Recreation Master Plan builds upon the vision and goals for this block, and it's developed uh, principles, strategies, and actions through its own robust process. So the comp plan update will fold in the strategies outlined in this new document directly into the comprehensive plan. Um, so these are the eight overarching strategies from the PRMP um, that have been incorporated as policies in the comp plan update for this block you've seen those before. Um, okay, so of course, this block covers more than just parks and recreation. Um, in addition, this block also covers natural resources, watersheds and habitat and energy, as I had just mentioned. Um, so Erica, if you just scroll down. Um, so those are the topic areas on the left. Um, and in the early stages of this block and through discussions with the TAC and the CAC, some preliminary concepts were identified as a focal point for further discussion um, as we work through this uh, process. Um, and so these key policy considerations are here on the right. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. But they include designing with nature, um, tree canopy, urban forests, and also light pollution. Um, so to learn more about these concepts and also just to better understand current conditions and practices regarding natural resource protection, environmental quality, habitat-friendly development practices, et cetera, 
Um, we reached out to several organizations, groups, agencies, and partners that have expertise in this field. Um, this list was generated with input from our CAC and our TAC, who were instrumental in guiding us into who we should be talking to, and also in some instances, providing us with some contacts. Um, so the list up above is just uh, those that we were able to reach to and, and speak with. Um, and these interviews helped educate our project team. It helped educate our CAC and our TAC about current local and regional trends and drivers of change, major opportunities and challenges, and also some best practices. All right, so healthy value ecosystems draft goals or policies and objectives. Um, as a reminder, there are many inputs that are part of this of the draft policies and objectives. Um, your packet has all of this information compiled for your review, and it does include all of the policies which are color coded um, to show which ones are new or revised concepts, which ones are being carried over from the current comprehensive plan, and which ones come from the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. So my hope is that that color coordination um, helps with a little bit of readability as to where all this comes from. Um, in this, uh, just th this evening, we were planning on providing just an overview of those draft policies and, and focusing on those that are new or revised concepts rather than working through them goal by goal, since all of that is in your packet. Um, so we did our, our outreach and engagement around those three uh, policy concepts that I noted up front. Um, these were the ones that emerged uh, early on, and these are the ones that we wanted to get more public input on. So here they are. Um, the first of which was design with nature. Um, I will just note, so we have the policy language on the left and then just a little snapshot of where um, the level of support was from the community with regards to this policy concept. Um, and just as a reminder, our surveys, they, they've been online. Um, they've been developed in conjunction with our PAT, um, who has been kind of guiding us through all of these, uh, our engagement efforts. Um, and the uh, online survey was live for a couple of weeks, um, and it went through all of the city's communication channels, so the Facebook page, Twitter, Nextdoor account, um, and was also sent to all utility customers via email. Um, the survey also had an open-ended question at the end, um, and all of this information was uh, forwarded and summarized to the CAC and the TAC and the Planning Commission. Um, so for the first concept, designing with nature, the policy states, support site development and design practices that encourage design with nature by incorporating and promoting natural ecosystem elements, including the planting of native trees and vegetation, minimizing effects on natural resources and avoiding the degradation or loss of wetland, watershed and ecosystem services. Um, so that scored quite highly um, in terms of support. Uh, the blue here is a like, um, orange is dislike, and then the little gray sliver there is a neutral slash don't know. The next policy concepts, concept deals with urban forests. Um, it kind of highlights uh, Sherwood's commitment to its tree canopy. Um, the language states, protect, protect Sherwood's urban forest by preserving tree canopy, inventorying significant tree stands, and working with partners to plant more native trees. Um, once again, yet another concept that garnered a significant amount of support, um, almost 90% support there for that one. The third concept is around light pollution. This is actually one that was missing in the current comprehensive plan. Um, so light pollution, uh, the statement reads, reduce the negative impacts of light pollution on human health and safety. Um, oops. Wildlife and ecosystem health, energy conservation, and night sky viewing by regulating the fixture direction and color temperature of outdoor lighting. Um, also one that received significant support for. All right, so um, through the course of our outreach disengagement, um, also discussions with our CAC and TAC, there were some additional concepts and ideas that arose. Um, these came after our groups were able to review the online survey, uh, the summary of the interviews, um, et cetera, to help craft additional supporting language. Um, this was also refined further by the Planning Commission. Um, these bullets here 
are uh, just those new concepts. Um, there's certainly more in the document. So we're just showing you here what's um, not uh, from the current comprehensive plan that's being carried over or the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Um, so here, you know, we talk about developing and regularly updating the city's Parks and Recreation Master Plan, um, et cetera. Next, this is just a second slide of some additional um, concepts uh, that include, you know, update or maintaining an up-to-date local wetlands inventory, um, having some language around uh, coordinating the cleanup of brownfield sites, um, maintaining a network of coordinated, sorry, of connected wildlife habitat corridors, um, and yeah, meeting multiple objectives with open space conservation, uh, and then also providing incentives and flexibility to the development community for the preservation of resources that are above code requirements. So these were all additional um, thoughts and suggestions from our CAC, TAC, and Planning Commission. All right, um, so that was an overview of what's new. Uh, next steps before I kind of uh, care, open it up for discussion, comments, and questions. Um, as I mentioned, we are ready to launch into the production of the comprehensive plan document over the next month or two. Uh, and then we hope to uh, start the adoption process through a series of planning commission and city council work sessions and hearings um, in the, by, by June. Um, and hopefully wrapping up by July. So with that, I will open it up to comments, questions, et cetera. Excellent questions, folk. Uh, can I make a quick comment? Yeah. I know I'm late to the party, but, uh, and maybe if um, like Julia is on the call or um, even if Erica is, um, one of the things that the that the uh, that the board talked about specifically was that um, light pollution that Anna East talked about, and uh, it's it's not especially insured. It's not necessarily oh, there's Erica, not necessarily a problem. But I've noticed, and I've talked to Julie about this, uh, that recently some of our newer developments are using like the newer, you know, LED lights, and they're really bright. And if they're not position just so. Uh, right now, this particular business I'm thinking of, they don't have any neighbors really, but it kind of points right into oncoming traffic. So it's not just, you know, polluting over into your neighbor's yard or, you know, a, a, an area of the park, which would was perfect for watching stars is now spoiled because there's this light bleeding into it. It's also about safety and, it, and on both directions. We want light, we want well-lit sidewalks, but sometimes, uh, anyway, so I, I've kind of poked Julie a couple times about that, but I don't know that we have a big a big issue yet, but I think it's on her. Yeah, that's it. That's my comment. Thank you. Cool. Other questions, comments? Rick, thanks for joining us. Do you like it? You happy? I lost Rick for a minute. No, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, we're, we're happy. I, I seem to be missing a lot of my uh, colleagues on the planning commission. Thanks, Mayor. You bet. I appreciate your, your work on this and your colleagues. Anybody else? Looks, looks good. Glad we're moving on to the next next part of this adventure. That seems to be at least we have an end in, an end in sight, which is great. Yeah, Julia, can you or Erica kind of when are we going to be completely done with this endeavor based on oh. current estimates? Yeah. I don't think you're ever, oh my goodness, my cat, um, sorry. I don't think you're ever completely done um, with, a, with a comprehensive plan. You know, there's, there's tweaking here and there, but Erica, can you speak to this particular schedule and being done with the adoption process and then the implementation? 
Yes. So I envision that we will have an adopted comp plan at least by the end of this summer, 2021. There's still some like additional work we have to do, such as producing the document and then getting back to our economic opportunities analysis, which is also required by the state. Okay. Excellent. And I, um, I joined a little bit late. I was having um, technical difficulties. And so maybe Anna East or Erica already mentioned this, but I, I know what we were hoping to happen from this meeting is if there's any um, any questions or concerns that you have of the planning commission to consider as they go forward in the adoption process, um, that would be great for them to hear. Um, and even if only one of them is here this evening, um, if there's any message that you want us to carry forward um, or they can listen to or Rick um, can carry forward on your behalf, that would be helpful. It's crickets. <laughs> it's perfect, I'm, I'm right? You can tell. <laughs> no, John, you're 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 good. Keep moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I love the work that they did on this. I know there's a lot of collaboration that was done on this. This wasn't something that was done in a silo, and I really appreciate all the outreach that was done on this and, and the work that the Planning Commission did to, to help move this along, to, to bring it to us to review and, and to tweak a little bit here and there. I know we've had some input that, um, you know, was, was hopefully appreciated um, by everybody. And, um, yeah, I think this is uh, something that really can move forward and and it kind of encapsulates what we're what we're looking to do here with the city. And it's great to it's great to have a, a plan. You know, I'm I'm a plan guy, so this uh, a lot of this looks pretty good. So yeah, great, great work. I love seeing how our master plans fold into our comprehensive plans. I like seeing how that that works together. So good job. Well. And Erica and Julia, there'll be the work doesn't end, as you said. So as the comp plan is finally updated, a lot of code changes could be on the horizon to make sure our code is up to date and can implement what we put all this time and effort in terms of putting a plan together. So that's that's correct. And I, I just want to emphasize that once we have an adopted comprehensive plan, we are developing an action plan that comes next, which really becomes our work program to implement the comp plan. So that will tell us, ding, 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 we should really go back and maybe possibly look at our lighting code section and do a little audit to make sure that, uh, you know, we are applying the correct standards for lighting in Sherwood, or at least the best practices. Yeah. And if there's, if there's zoning changes or, mm -hmm. or language about zoning <clears throat> that needs to be modified based on the updated comp plan, a new comp plan. Yeah. Um, the middle housing piece, which we also have the mandate from Salem as well anyways, but um, lots of different, lots of different pieces. Yeah, I just want to say I really appreciate all the hard work that um, staff and planning commission has put into the whole process, including this document, the park master plan. I mean, it's, it's awesome work. I'm, I'm very excited about getting to the output of this, which really gets to code changes and, and how this is really gonna impact our community moving forward. And I would just throw this out there as, a, as we've gone through this, are there areas of, we don't have to answer it tonight, but we should be thinking about it. Are there areas of the code that we need to address sooner than later? Um, you know, when it comes to some of the, the things we're trying to achieve around, you know, better parking options. You know, you guys have all heard me, my laundry list of items that I'm concerned about, but it'd be interesting to start thinking about, are there things we need to address early versus, you know, towards the end when we address the bulk of it in the code? Yeah, and there, there might very well be, and that um, we'll have the action plan once we adopt it, but you know, they're currently working on um, the HB 2001 stuff and parking um, naturally fits in with that and, and other things. So, um, 
Yeah. And I was, and I've talked with staff today about another thing that we'll talk offline about with council um, that we might want to do and you know, a little faster than, than other stuff. Um, just because it's been identified already is it there's areas that we know we need to, to fix. And so, yeah, some things maybe we should do a touch up now and do a deep dive more in a year. You know, and if anybody I, has ideas to certainly bring them up as well, staff. Yeah, and I thank you, uh, Mayor. And I, I, I bring that up because we are seeing such an acceleration in uh, development, especially on the job side, you know, just making sure that it's all happening the way we envision it happening. Yep. Yep, yep. And I think the nice thing is, is that we, we are now far enough along and close enough to the end that um, it, it doesn't seem premature to move forward on some things that are potentially more urgent. I think if, if we had been talking about major tweaks a year ago, I might have been a little bit more concerned because we wanted to see the outcome of this project, but we're really near the end. <laughs> um, and it's really just the, the buttoning everything up, so. Correct. Yep. All right. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. A lot of lot more on your plate, Rick. You and your team, as you'll see, and it'll it'll be it'll, it'll shift into the more when I say tangible versus the theory and the and the dreaming, you know, phase. The high level stuff to get to the meat and potato stuff before you know it. Yeah, it's been a busy season for the planning commission, so we appreciate the comments. I'll relay them on to the planning commission. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. I think it's always a busy season for the planning commission. I don't think they really get a break, do they? Don't tell him that. He doesn't know yet. <laughs> Erica promised something this summer. I don't know. Well, I think maybe you get maybe one meeting next month and then back to reality. So, so Mr. Mayor, I see that Commissioner Rosenthal has now joined us. So... Yeah, awesome. Um, um, yeah, so we'll, in a moment, we'll move to our city council work session, which will be a, um, an update um, from Metro, um, specifically from uh, President Lynn Peterson and uh, our commissioner, uh, Garrett Rosenthal is with us as well, who represents us specifically. Um, but um, Mayor, I might mention, uh, President Peterson said she might be a little bit late. So if you want to move forward, I would uh, take over and, and at least fill in until she shows up, is able to show up. Oh, okay. Um, excellent. Yeah, because the, then we'll have more time for, for questions. Uh, sure. She was good enough to send, or her staff, whoever was good enough to send her presentation in advance, um, which is great. And um, a, lot on, a lot of council members probably already taken a little bit of a glance at it, but let's... Um, get through that, you know, in relative speed. I, I figured that was probably your plan so we can have Q and A to chat about stuff that's else that's going on in your, in your world, ideas, goals, um, uh, planning, and then stuff from our side as well. I do want to touch base on one issue. Uh, you did, have you gotten official notice that the, the request for, for a six month extension was approved uh, last week? Yes, yes, okay. yep. Appreciate that, uh, uh, Garrett. And um, I, I haven't talked with um, Mayor Snyder of Taggart, but um, I know he, they were, they were anxiously awaiting it as well. And yeah. we'll see if uh, see where we're at from uh, from our side as we get through updating Sherwood West. And um, so that's that's good stuff. Hey, now, do you have the presentation or do you want our staff to put it up for you and let you start walking through it or what's what was your preference if your staff could put it up and uh and i'll just tell you when to turn the page that would be great okay so brad if you can you put it up yeah give me a second here okay awesome. i believe there's only 10 or 11 slides so it won't shouldn't take long to get through it's it's pretty much a uh, 25, 30,000 feet kind of view. It doesn't, uh, and as you know, uh, President Peterson certainly could get into the history and some of the details and some of the weeds a lot more than I can on questions, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. 
And incidentally, it's nice to nice to be here and see you all again. Well, yeah, we were lamenting that it's it's really a, almost a, a mistake to be having a city council meeting on such a beautiful uh, spring 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 evening. Well, I, I hope you can all be sitting outside on your deck or patio or something and uh, and doing this because uh, I you can see a cherry tree behind me, so I'm I'm outside. Yeah, good for you. Now I have the glare of artificial light shining in my face. Wow. I could open my drapes, but then I'd be blinded because I'm my my window faces the wrong way from where my home office is. Great sunsets, but I'm ready to go anytime you can get it up. You know, Brad's digging it up. Yes, and Renee's now showing off. She's on her deck as well. <laughs> <laughs> well you know, you, the lighting is such you can't see my face, but on the other hand, that's not really much of a loss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can. Oh, no. so, um, since I am pre, I am streaming the the recording too. I'm not sure how this will affect, but let's give it a shot. I just want to give you the. the Heads up that something funky might happen as I present, and also I'm trying to stream at the same time. Hey, Brad, I have it available here if you want me to do it. If you know, if you're worried about streaming, um, well, let's just give it a shot. This is different than the time before where we had problems, so let's let's just give it Zoom. So we shouldn't have problems, right, Councilor Rosner? Right. You guys Here's the that? test. There you go. Good job. There you go. That's it. Yeah, this is, anyhow, welcome. This is meant to be just a, like I said, a 25, 30,000 foot view of what's going on at Metro. Some of the things are new, some of them are not. Uh, I, you know, I may ad lib a little bit and of course then the questions and hopefully okay. President okay. Peterson will. Here you go. Hello? All right, second, next one. Uh, mainly what this is, met. what does Metro do? I mean, I think you all know this, but we just wanted to emphasize, we, uh, we help, we try and support the region in five, in five key areas, visitor venues, garbage and recycling, long range planning, affordable housing and parks and nature. And you could expand that and say garbage, long range planning, including transportation, affordable housing, and now supportive housing services. So those are the main areas. Oops, my, my screen just did something, but I'll, all right, next slide. Uh, one of the things, of course, we want to report, and that's one of the greatest uh, success stories, of course, is uh, is the zoo, which is uh, opening, which has now opened its polar exhibit, the Polar uh, Passage, and Nora is back. Um, they're open every day of the week now. That just happened last week, and Nora is much more mature and apparently appears to be quite happy in her new environments. There's also, you know, the expanded uh, primate exhibit as well as the rhino exhibit. These are pretty much built, but we're, because of COVID, we're still awaiting shipment of some uh, primates as well as some rhinos. So we don't have the full complement, but it's wonderful. As you know, the zoo provided a really nice way to sit in your car, have hot chocolate and see a whole bunch of lights at Christmas. This was very popular. And it also was very helpful in, in keeping the zoo from going into arrears. So anyhow. So, so what's, your, what's your feeling? I, I am I am more than a slightly torn that you brought Nora back alone, took her away from her friend. Well, she, it wasn't working out. I mean, we Nora was taken back the way I understand it. Nora was taken back because it wasn't working out at the current at the zoo she was in. So there was plans to get her some companionship, but it just okay. they the pairing didn't work very well. And the other zoo said, you know, we can't continue. So it was more, it wasn't like we tried to bring Nora back to be alone, um, but she needed to go someplace and this was, this was more or less her home. So I don't know what the plans are for getting a, a companion. I, I, I wish I could tell you. Yeah, it's not a fan. But it's a nice exhibit. She has a couple play pools and, and uh, 
appears to be adapting. It doesn't seem she, she minds. And the other thing is you need to note that we have, you know, the zoo is a national leader in conservation, particularly for the condors. There is a, you know, a condor recovery uh, site in uh, Clackamas County at an undisclosed location. Um, and so, but that's one of the national leader things that, uh, that uh, the Oregon Zoo has helped with. So next slide. Uh, the five centers for the performing arts, obviously this is a key entertainment uh, uh, venue set downtown. They've been closed. And there's one of the reasons why the main layoffs that Metro had to endure were really through these because a lot of particularly temporary and seasonal people were laid off. These are, we're still waiting for um, sort of guidance from the state as to how these can open and when they can open. As you may imagine, these things can't just open at 10% capacity. It's, there's too much work that goes into keeping them prepared and to making presentations. But this is a major thing and we're hoping to get them rolling this year with, uh, you know, with vaccinations for everybody. Next slide. The Expo and Convention Center, however, have been very active. Uh, they hosted the Red Cross staging during the wildfires. That wasn't required so much in Washington County, but in Clackamas County, there are a lot of people who were leaving the fires and it, uh, at the Expo Center, they parked their big rigs and their, their mobile homes there for quite a while. Uh, the Convention Center was an emergency shelter for fire evacuees and also for people during the cold period. And they are both the Expo and OCC have been centers of, of nine, COVID-19 testing and the, uh, the convention center is actually one of the premier high throughput vaccination centers in the country. It's something like uh, five or 6,000, no, it's more it's like 8,000 per day in some cases. So it's really quite a model and uh, they've got it down to a science. Uh, I've got mine out at the airport, but uh, apparently it goes very smoothly. So those are things that we've been using it for hoping to reopen them. As you know, we did have the boat show, or I mean, I'm sorry, the sportsman show was two weekends ago, or weekend and a half ago. And that was quite a success, a little more limited than normal. But from what I hear, the people uh, were quite happy with the way it worked out. Hey, Garrett, could I, ask, could I ask you a question on that, Garrett? Sure. Yeah. So um, there's been some talk about redeveloping that, that expo land where the sportsman show was was held and that's that's such a wonderful resource uh, for regional shows and stuff. Has there been any more discussion about that? There, is, yeah, and that's a good good point. I mean, there are people who have said, well, the expo is a big piece of, of property and it could be used for other things. So uh, what Metro has said is it, we're not even making any plans to not do what it is, but we've said we, we're open to suggestions or ideas and then we will do an analysis to see if there is something, some better thing for the site. I mean, as you know, it occupies about 50 acres in a very prime sort of in industrial area near a, a bunch of, and it's not centrally located in, in the area, but there is no plans to get rid of it in its current um, session. The people that use it, the Merck Center people are quite strong in their opinions that it serves a very good function for smaller business in its current format. and. Um, but the question has been opened in saying, is this the best and highest use for these? There's also some other issues, of course, as you know, two of the pavilions have historical uh, connections, particularly to the Vanport era. So there's, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of questions on, on historical conservation as well. Yeah, I, I, if, if I could make a recommendation, if, if there is um, sure. more conversation on that, it would be great to have that to be a very public process with public input because that's that's a, a great resource for the region and I would I would hate to lose it. Yeah, I, I think I absolutely agree. It's something that needs to be very open and very public. The, I think the reason it came up and this goes a little back before my time is that of all the facilities during good economic situations, it was the one that was sort of closest to break even um, because of the costs of maintaining it and because some of these shows didn't bring in the same kind of high dollar uh, venue. I don't know if that's the main reason why it's, people said, well, maybe we, should, we can have a use for this industrial site. Maybe there can be an art center, maybe a film center. I've heard a bunch of different concepts, but I, you know, I certainly don't have an, a strong opinion. I agree with you. A lot of people, uh, particularly from around the region. And in fact, I just saw 
some data today that about, oh, I don't know, 40% of the people that use it are basically out of the area that come to these things, like whether it's the boat show or the, uh, the sportsman show and so forth, the home and garden yeah. show, Clark County, they brings in a lot of people from Washington as well. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and because you mentioned, I have to ask the question, is, is the art center uh, profitable then, the one downtown? You mean the five venues? Yeah. They pay, well, I, exactly how profitable, I can't tell you. They do pay their way. They primarily cover their own costs. And that's because they can, they, they adjust the ticket prices to do that. There is some subsidy from tax dollars as well as from the city of Portland. They're owned by the city of Portland, you know, but we're ma they're managed by Metro. Right. So, um, you know, this every year is a little bit different. This They obviously weren't profitable in, in 2020. <laughs> well, no, but it's awesome. I and mean, we, we talk a lot about our center and making sure that it's at a minimum break even because it kind of protects it from a downturn, right? right? And yeah. making sure we have that resource going forward. Anyways, I'll yeah, the down the downtown centers, aid, from my understanding, aid into their reserves to some extent. Awesome. Uh, all right, next slide. Thank you. And did I hear President Peterson uh, show up, or not? No. No. All right. Obviously, no garbage and recycling is one of the big things we do. Uh, recycling is a big thing. It takes a lot of work to get things out of the recycling system that shouldn't be there. Uh, We've had discussions with this before, as you know, there's the, we made the system investment to purchase a property and now the process of figuring out exactly what service it could provide uh, for the site in Cornelius is, is underway. There's a similar process going on with the Metro South, which is size constrained. And so there's a question of whether an additional site is necessary to help it handle the kind of load that it does and so forth. And then of course, there's the regional uh, effort to get large food purveyors uh, to do more composting of their food scraps. Uh, next slide. Uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, obviously one of the things Metro does is, is responsible through the UGB, but also considered under long range planning is the transportation planning and, uh, you know, dealing with pollution from freeways. There's obviously a lot of different elements to this planning. There's the, you know, the flexible funds, there's planning for larger term projects. There's working with ODOT on various projects. Uh, one of the things that's recent is coming out with the mapping of the emergency routes. Uh, that is particularly the routes that emergency, need, emergency vehicles would need to use in case of some sort of emergency. Not, we're not talking evacuation routes. So that has been updated uh, fairly recently. So identifying this and then trying to identify resources to make these both safe as well as functional in terms of if there is an emergency and it could be fire, it could be earthquake, it could be local floods, who knows? There's a lot of different possibilities. Uh, all right, next slide. Uh, economic development. I mean, one of the main things, and this is probably something that's a little newer to me, is uh, one of the main ways of economic development. Of course, one of the proposals was some of the transportation uh, uh, bond, transportation tax measure that didn't pass, that would have provided a lot of economic development for safety and equity and for a lot of the uh, thoroughfares that, that we know. Uh, but we are investing in working families uh, through a lot of the projects. One of the big ones we're working with the GPI Greater Portland Inc. in developing a particularly a five year strategy for how this region should come into a, a, a more I would say profitability be a bit, but a little stronger economic recovery. So that's something that is ongoing. Um, and then there is the, uh, S, what is it, S2, C2, the, um, uh, the, the worker, uh, I always get the acronym wrong, basically to provide equitable pay for workers in the, in the construction and service industries and promoting the aspects of training and bringing people uh, of disadvantaged communities into these, into the training programs and then into the uh, construction and development programs. So our goal is to assist the small cities and uh, through transportation planning and through other planning and through appropriate um, workplace developments in, in fostering the economic recovery. We're not specifically an economic uh, recovery agency, but working with Greater Portland 
Inc. Uh, that is something that we're uh, working to assist with. Next slide. Um, in, as part of that, of course, is economic recovery. If we can get more people into houses and more people in stable lives, that's less of a drain on the system and more people who are able to contribute to the recovery. As you know, we have the bond issue in 2018 passed and there's a lot of money and a lot of projects that are ongoing for this bond project. This shows some of the ones in, in Washington County. Um, I know of several, in, there's in Tigard and Beaverton and uh, also in Tualatin as well as out in Hillsboro. Some of these are, are built, the one in, at least the one in Beaverton is should be opening to residents very shortly. One on the good news is we've committed 34% of the resources for that, that the bond issue provided for housing and we've 54% of the goal. So it, the way it's going, some of this is, you know, there's a lot of economic factors that went into that. Uh, some of this would imply that we are, are likely to be able to provide more housing for the same amount of money than was originally projected in the bond issue. And this doesn't show the rest of the, the, the metro district, but there's also a lot of, of uh, housing developments going on. There are several going on in Portland that are independent of this particular process as well. So getting people into housing is a, is a big deal. Uh, next slide. Supportive housing. Uh oh, it tells me my battery is running low. I may have to move and get a, a charger here. Uh, in fact, I will, so I don't run into a problem. The supportive housing was passed this last spring, as you know, and it's a, it was a taxation measure. That, hold on one second, there we go. All right, our goal functional Functionally to end chronic homelessness in Greater Portland by 2030. It's a tall task. There's a lot of people doing it. As you know, there's a, it's, this is money that's going to come into the starting in July. My understanding is the first quarterly prepayment came in about a week ago, but it's going to start being dispersed in July and it's going to out, go out to the counties. We are currently working on what they call LIPS, uh, local implementation plans. We have the one that's not formally adopted yet, but it's, in, it's been done and is being reviewed by Multnomah County. Washington County is working on one as well, and Clackamas County is working on one. So hopefully by July or very shortly thereafter, we will have three um, local implementation plans, and then the money can start being dispersed to the counties to go to the nonprofit organizations, the community organizations, uh, like uh, community partners uh, for affordable housing, which is based, I think, in Tiger to Tualatin and various others. So the money can go to them to providing the kind of wraparound services that people need, which includes, you know, met, uh, behavioral health issues and uh, substance abuse issues. So it's a complex process. Uh, I will not claim to be a social scientist. So there's a lot about it I still don't understand. But I, you know, the goal is lofty, and the goal is is worth worth working very hard to, and, and uh, Metro is committed to doing that. Uh, next slide. And I don't want to forget about uh, parks and nature. Uh, Metro now has about seventeen thousand acres of open space around Greater Portland. You're aware of a, a number of these. Uh, some, uh, you know, there's a, a Graham Oaks in Wilsonville. Plus, we're working with uh, we're working on a couple other. Uh, projects, particularly the Wyoming Falls project. That's where we're working in, con in coordination with the Grand Ronde tribes. And then we're always open to suggestions for other properties that maybe should be acquired that are outside of the reach of a city, but that provide to a continuous kind of, um, you know, I wouldn't say a green belt necessarily, but to green patches throughout the region. Obviously we have trails and the uh, Tonkin Ice Age Trail is one of those. That's going to connect all the way north, all the way through, and with a spur, including connections into uh, Sherwood. So uh, there's nice places, Cooper Mountain, Orenco Woods, and Killam Wetlands. I have not visited all of those. We're also um, it, it going to be working to clean up a, a, a major site on the Willamette River, which is called Willamette Cove. Exactly how that's going to work out is still to be determined, but the DEQ issued a record of decision and this would be a 16, 18 acre site right along by the, um, by the railroad bridge. At any rate, 
Um, I have not been to the Shehalem Ridge Natural Area, but that's opening. And then there's the Newell Creek area, which is over in um, West Oregon City, which is just about ready to open. So that's an active program. And then there is all, yeah, that's an active program. I think I'll stop there. Next slide, if there is one. So, like I said, I can't give you all the details, but if there's any questions about particular park projects or, uh, you know, the solid waste issue or anything else, uh, give it give it a shot, and I'll try and give you an answer. I don't have the history, obviously. So, but that's it. Thanks, Garrett. Appreciate that. Questions? Questions for Garrett? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Rosenthal. Um, in light of, uh, I know one of the, uh, the purposes of Metro is to foster economic development within the region. And in light of the right. kinds of activities that are happening, you know, in the downtown Portland area, is, is Metro assisting the city? Is Metro providing guidance? Are we, is Metro in a regional way trying to assist in bringing you know tourism back to downtown portland or what what is metro doing to help with that situation well I, I, it would be hard we occasionally do try and provide guidance to the city of portland that's not as easy as it sounds um as you may understand they have their own way of doing things sometimes but yes we are doing things one of the things we're doing is we have what you call the rid patrol which gets rid of you know illegal dumping and we're expanding that RID patrol, which hopefully will help clean up some of the areas in the Portland area. So that is some of the things uh, and providing more, as I said, more housing and supportive services and giving a lot about, it's more than 50%, I think it's like 56% of 53% of the supporting housing services money is gonna be dedicated to Multnomah County and the city of Portland. And so hopefully that will help them deal with some of the social problems that they have downtown. I, as far as I know, we, we aren't doing anything, uh, well, the Greater Portland Inc. That's something that's fairly new and in process. And I'd have to review that more before I gave you a clear answer on that. Thank you. So uh, Garrett, this, this is Tim Rose. Uh, um, and Council, uh, Metro Council President Lynn Peterson has just joined us, so welcome. Oh, there she is. Garrett did a great job I'm um, going through the, the presentation. Now we're doing Q&A. Councilor Rosenthal, thank you so much. If you know the Hillsborough City Council wasn't so talkative. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's where I was prior. <laughs> Great. So, are, uh, are you Tim, saying that Hillsborough has priority priority over us? They started earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That, that's how it, that's how it rolls. The council that starts earlier gets. <laughs> thank you, Councilor. <laughs> Um, President Peterson, Russell uh, Griffin just asked a question which I couldn't really give him a full answer on. It was to what extent or how are we helping the city of Portland to bring its economy back? Um, oh, yeah. In economic uh, recovery. Yeah, I, I'd say there's the, the, the top two priorities there are uh, homelessness and uh, garbage pickup. And so that's where we've been focusing the majority of our efforts. Obviously, the supportive housing service measure is extremely important to being able to get the money to Multnomah County uh, so that they can deliver on getting people off the street and start moving them off. Their local implementation plan was just uh, given, it's gone through all of its oversight processes and it has now risen to the Metro Council level. Um, they are looking to about 1,000 people that they'll be able to serve getting them off the street a year from this measure. Uh, which is huge uh, when you consider that there's at least 6,000 uh, people in the streets now across the entirety of the region. And then there are more that are not counted, right? Because they're not actually on the streets, but they're couch surfing um, or living in their car and moving around in their trailers. So um, it, it's definitely gonna take the full 10 years to get everybody off the street, but uh, that is where the majority of our focus has been, is just getting the supportive housing service measure up and running. And then, of course, we have a regional illegal dumping program that we had to put on hold during COVID. We had two teams. Those two teams were using incarcerated labor. And incarcerated labor was not allowed to leave the, the Multnomah County Jail during COVID. And so we weren't able to use them anyway. 
Um, and then working with Reimagine Oregon, which is a group that came together after the George Floyd murder with all of the Black Lives protest, um, Black Lives Matter protests, they galvanized themselves together, called all the elected officials in the region together and said, here are the things that we have been wanting for the last 30 years so that we are not at this point ever again. Will you please look at all of them? And one of them was, please don't use in incarcerated labor. Please start paying living wage jobs so we can start building resumes. So we looked at our, re our regional illegal dumping program in the midst of not having one, right? Because we couldn't use incarcerated labor and said, we're gonna move to a new model. And that's what we're doing is we're doing a workforce initiative instead of incarcerated labor. And the, uh, the big news there is that we're going from two teams to six teams because we, we know that there's a problem out there. And even then our regional legal dumping teams would not have been able to overcome the problem that we're seeing out there. Um, the, the, the garbage out on, on the interstates in our public places is not from the homeless. The homeless are being used as an excuse by folks to either just go ahead and do illegal dumping because they don't want to go pay for it at the transfer stations, right? Or they can't afford their bills right now. So the amount of illegal dumping has just skyrocketed. And um, between the city of Portland's renewed efforts um, on working with Solve, neighborhood programs, um, you know, basically adopting a block, just keep your block clean. Like <laughs> that people just want to help out, right? So that's how we're participating in helping the city of Portland on those two issues. On the greater economics, we are part of the travel industry. So the sooner we can get the Oregon Convention Center up and running, the sooner Expo is up and running, we can start bringing in visitor development funds that then are poured back into the system and we can bring back the 750 people who we laid off at the Oregon Zoo, the Convention Center, and the Expo Center. Um, that, that's just a start, right? And then the last piece, I would admit, we're doing a lot, evidently. <laughs> and, and then the last piece, is, which is region-wide, um, but it, it, it obviously will be focused a lot on the areas that, that are having the biggest problems, like the uh, city of Portland's downtown sector and some of their smaller uh, main streets. Um, is the Greater Portland Inc. work where we have the five-year economic recovery plan. And uh, we have worked, uh, Mayor Calloway from Hillsborough is actually on that um, and is working very hard on the growth of our existing businesses, retention of them, keep them here so they don't go away. My husband who owns a business in Wilsonville, just four of them, pretty small high-tech company, um, for the last 15 years, got a letter from Clark County, Identity Clark County, asking them to relocate. And I, oh. held, I held it up to the screen with the mayor of Vancouver. And she's like, oh God. <laughs> um, so it, it really is a thing, right? We, people are looking to try and attract folks away from, so we just need to retain who we have. And then we need to think about attracting people here again, right? Um, we've been too focused on attracting and not about growing and retaining. And so we're going to, we're really focusing on that and all of the pieces that are necessary that in a new economy, there's going to be a need for, um, um, how do you work at home? Right. That, the whole idea of how, how does half the workforce, it's about half the workforce that stayed at home. Right. And if half of them are working two to three days at home, then what are their needs going to be? just trying to think about all those things. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, it was actually longer answer than I had anticipated. <laughs> uh, Tim had a, was started to ask a question. Before. Oh yeah, hi there, um, Tim Rosner. So uh, just kind of building on what you just talked about with uh, retaining businesses, you know, I, uh, before we sold the company, we had, a, we had um, 100 employees in the, I call it the R2D2 building in downtown Portland, the one that looks like a band roll on right across the street from the, uh, the Heathman, if you know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we, before we sold the company, we were actually looking at moving to Clark County too. But the, the main reason was, well, one, downtown was, even before COVID, was starting to deteriorate a little bit. Yeah. But the bigger reason was taxes. When you started looking at the Nexus tax system, it was a huge economic benefit for us to relocate. And is 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 that being talked about at all? Is Metro advocating at the state level to make it a little easier for, from a financial standpoint for businesses uh, to stay in Oregon? 
Firstly, Metro uh, is not involved in the city of Portland decisions regarding their own taxation rates. Um, and we certainly wouldn't go above their heads and ask the legislature to. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't necessarily refer referring to Portland okay. taxes. I was referring to more like revenue treatments for out-of-state revenue and, you know, and stuff like that. Oh, oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. yeah um, well, we have been brought into this conversation um, uh, via the um, income tax uh, for high income business earners on the support of housing services that and Multnomah County has a similar tax. And we're trying, yes, we are trying to work out with the state how to make sure that um, you're not um, um, disproportionately impacting the folks in the state with b better benefits to those out of state. Um, so yeah, we are, we are looking at how to how to deal with that. Great, thank you. Awesome. More questions? Well, I have another one. If no one else is going to ask, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I've got um, a list too, but I'll let Tim might hit one or two of them. Yeah. So uh, where? So you know, as you know, we met with some of your staff back in December when we were talking about tipping fees and. Um, it was a good meeting and, and, and uh, I really enjoyed the exchange of ideas and collaboration that was happening in that meeting. And, but one of the things that came out of that was uh, doing a regional uh, feasibility study. And I was just curious where we were at with that in terms of looking at regional needs for uh, garbage, hazardous waste, you know, all the different issues that, that, that we're coming up against and where, we are, where we're at in that process. Um, well, I know that there's a lot of outreach prior to COVID. And I think we tried to do some during COVID. Um, and I, I would need to uh, ask the staff to get back to you because we have not had a, a big overview update. I don't know, Councilor Rosenthal, do you have any specific information? Um, I don't think we have a full study done yet. We've just had some engagement around it. Um, no, I don't, I can't add much there. I mean, obviously there is a, an outreach effort that, that's going to deal with some of those issues when it comes to the to the west side property and figuring out what the best thing to do with that. And that'll address some of those. But beyond that, I, like I said, I wasn't here during the COVID, most of the COVID crisis. So I can't tell you but let's the, hope, what the status is. Let's hope that we're not building something on that property without understanding the true scope of needs. Like this. Oh, no, 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 we, we will definitely understand the impacts. The council has made that very clear to staff. I just can't tell you where we are in the study right now. Um, so we'll get back to you on that. Thank you, yeah, Councillor. And I think I think what we're hoping for is, you know, there's a study that says here's the need. And then part two is, okay, what are the different options to fulfill that need from That's Metro building a facility or contracting out with a third party hauler, whatever those are. Yeah. Like, there's a very public process around that. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, those questions are, are all open. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Well, I just want to thank Councillor Rosenthal for uh, doing the- We've got more questions. Don't worry. We're not giving up, <laughs> giving up yet. Um, oh, we're not done. Okay. We're not done. But I can um, still thank my, my, my fellow councillor, right? Yes, we we uh, we were talking his ear off so much that we, we had to pull him back inside outside of the sunshine and put plug his computer back into power. Um, uh, first, fairly quick, Horizon, eight, eight, next 18 months, what's the what's the slate of taxes to be advocated for new or to be renewed? Uh, the only thing right now that we know about uh, in the next yeah 18 months is the green space levy renewal. Okay. Um, with the 10 year plan of helping with the homeless, um, I, I say 10 years and that just does not even seem like, like a reasonable time frame. Um, but it, it's safe to say that if there's action at the federal level, um, we would welcome it um, in that category to help accelerate programs to. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, this has been an accumulation of many different things, but lack of federal funding, lack of state funding over time, along with global economic conditions and then a global pandemic. I mean, it, 
the fact that we had more people moving here during the last recession, right? And no housing being built because <laughs> it was a housing bubble. Um, all of those things combined led to where we are today. And it's obviously not just a Portland issue. It's a, it's a nationwide problem um, that is definitely culminating in, in a lot of the major metropolitan cities ending up with issues around this. How they handle them, it has been very different, especially um, in the major cities of those major metropolitan areas. Yeah, as one elected official in a, in a city, I would be hopeful that the state would start studying to fix with our property tax system. Because um, back in the day, cities used to be able to participate more in- That's right. Affordable housing. Measure five and measure 50, yes. Um, and the inequities that have since occurred because of those, anyways. That's, that's um, right. Other questions? Tim? Uh, can I just add to that? In a weird way, you know, with, with a lot of employees moving to the suburbs and moving away from the high cost areas, I think we're feeling a little bit of that in Sherwood. We had in March, we had 31 homes sell and the mean sale pr price was uh, 50 or 595,000, which is a huge increase, you know? So we're, and that's not helping um, housing affordability at all. And, uh, no. yeah. and, when, you, and when you look at, um, uh, folks thinking forward and saying, well, I don't, I don't think I want to go into the office more than once a week. You now bend is doable. Yep. Right. So they're growing like, like anybody's business along with, with a lot of our, um, uh, cities on, on the edge of the urban growth boundary and, you know, um, from North Plains to uh, Cascade Locks. I mean, Cascade Locks is booming. Have you been to Cascade Locks lately on a weekend? This... It's it blows your mind. It blows your mind. I mean, they've got breweries, they've got, right? There's just so many more people living there and everybody's out. And um, which is like, I think one of the, the benefits of COVID-19 is everybody is reminded that they have this beautiful backyard that they haven't been really utilizing and now all my favorite spots where nobody had been they're people <laughs> but i'm just so glad that they're out right and sledding and, and hiking and snow i'm just it's just amazing and that's why i think Cas places like cascade locks um north plains they're, they're attracting people because it's a lifestyle that people have wanted but they weren't sure that they could do it because they had to go into work every day so it there, there's going to be some some changes happening. And, and that's one of the things that we need to answer before we go out for a transportation measure again, is how have things changed? As well as how do we finance a transportation measure going forward? So we'll, we'll, still, we'll still be working on that conversation, but we don't know when or how much or what. what we all, all we know is that people like the package in terms of the content. Um, and uh, we'll be looking at those other issues over the next several months. Uh, I'm assuming Metro is participating in with our federal team in terms of earmarks um, to potentially deal with some of that. Yes, most of those earmarks will go to already existing projects, though. So whether you're talking about the I-5 bridge that we already know about is an existing project that's right, ready to almost ready to go. Um, I-5 Rose Quarter, the the Abernathy Bridge. Um, uh, it, it'll be the projects we already know about. The, the problem is getting to the next set of projects. We have not spent the money planning for the next set of projects, nor do we have match to compete nationwide. So that's why a transportation package locally is gonna be very important because we're, we're not gonna get the support below the interstates to do any work from the state or the feds if, unless we have match. You know, if, if I could make a suggestion on that, you know, and I was in the last uh, GPI meeting where we were going over that economic plan and I brought it up in there, but um, I think the smaller cities really need help getting their key projects, uh, what I like to call grant ready, right? Yep. It's really it's really hard to compete against a Milwaukee or a Beaverton or a Hillsboro who have huge staff that can put in all that effort. So when the opportunities come up, they immediately get to the first of the line. I know I'm oversimplifying, but I think Metro could really help out smaller cities and getting some of those key projects to a point where they're they're, they're ready, you know, they're, they're a project that's ready to go. 
I, I think that's good. And the only funding we have is through JPAC and the MTIP process. So what I would what I would consider um, is is working that through the Washington County Coordinating Committee um, and talking to the other coordinating committees about uh, creating a pot of money for grants to get projects ready um, that meet you know to meet the regional vision as well as the city's needs. So yeah, yeah I, we I, have that to a smaller extent in, in in Washington County, but maybe they can bump it up a little bit. There you um, go. The one slide, that, that one line on the slide is concerning. I know why it's on there, but I just want to highlight it of reducing pollution from automobiles. It implies, you know, maybe not doing road projects. Um, and I mean, I, there's an audience and I understand why it's there, but it, that will, will happen if you address diesel vehicles and as the automobiles in a higher and higher percentage go electric. So, uh, just a statement. It's concerning that it's listed the way it's listed. The um, the the observation is so noted, um, but we also agree that a lot of it is electrification of the transportation system. Uh, we need to keep going the way we've been going on vehicle miles traveled because of the good work that the city of Sherwood has done and all other 23 cities, 22 cities, um, uh, in basically really doing the work and planning your community to be a complete community so that people don't have to drive, you know, through miles and miles and miles of subdivisions to get to the dry cleaner or just to the grocery store. By doing that, by reducing vehicle miles traveled, you also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So much appreciated on all the work to do that. Yep, and that is a primary goal as we, along with needed housing, as we look at doing the fresh relook of Sherwood West, because we are a bedroom community and despite having short trips, we are, I mean, we're, we're in the top 10 most dense cities in Oregon um, already. We have, the, because it's so young and you know, we don't have these 20, 30,000 square foot lots that some cities have, um, you know, we, we're under 5,000 square feet per lot, I think, or about well, based, five. Based on square miles, we're actually more dense than the city of Portland in terms of housing units per acre, which yeah. surprises a lot of people. Yeah, um, and I think we're the most dense city in Washington County. Um, but I digress, the, um, the added, not just it being convenient for daily needs, but being convenient to have more people be able to live and work um, in town is is a big push too. So, yeah, and just, as, as you know, we, yeah, and as you know, we've been really working hard on economic development because you know we have we're eighty five percent residential. Um, we only have I think last time I looked seven hundred people that live and work in Sherwood. So we really want to give people the opportunity to live and work here and bring the type of those family wage jobs. Yeah, you know, we need flex more flexibility more options on the housing side for part of that, you know, so it's the yep. whole thing. Well, I, I had just been excited about the transportation package and bringing planning money to your your Highway 99 um, issues. Um, so hopefully we can still get that, that passed at some point so that uh, some portion, maybe in the future, you've already got the planning money and then we're helping with construction. So looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. So we ran over, but that's good. It was a good conversation and we, um, I, we don't mind running a little long for um, good conversations. So we appreciate your time, Metro President uh, Peterson and Councilor Rosenthal. Uh, very much appreciate your joining us today. Any last questions? Well, before we close it, I just wanna say thank you uh, for all the work that you guys do at the city. I know having been at Lake Oswego City Council, Chair of Clackamas County, that the work on the ground happens with the city councils and the county commissions. Um, I, completely, we're, we're, I completely forgot that you're on Lake O City Council. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I just wanna just say that that's where my heart is. That's what I feel like the regional government is here is to help us achieve what we set out for with our shared values as a region. Um, but you guys really do the majority of the work. And so thank you for, for all that you do. And I wanna thank Councillor Rosenthal for running um, and being a part of the council. He has been a great addition. You are well represented and uh, we, we really do uh, appreciate the unique perspective that he brings um, from uh, talking to you guys uh, even more frequently than I can. So uh, thank you for all of that. And, your clear communication, Mayor. 
Um, and <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I just don't put a lot of shine on it. I just kind of say it. <laughs> no, it's much appreciated. Uh, it's better than, you know, um, trying to beat around the bush. So I, I, I appreciate that. And then we can, then we can actually start to work on whatever the issue is. Right. Uh, right. Be honest. Put the, put the, put the cards out on the table and let's figure it out. That's right. That's right. And I'll tell you if I have any cards, but <laughs> absolutely. I know you, I know you play a little poker on the side. So, so uh, anyway, I just wanted to recognize Councilor Rosenthal and all his good work as well as yourself. So thank you. Awesome. And, and uh, I just want to say one more thing. I've had a couple of meetings with uh, Marissa and uh, uh, I think she's awesome. Um, I think you guys got a good pick there and I enjoyed talking to her. We're very lucky. Um, she, she leads with her heart and common sense and <laughs> That's a, it's a good combination, especially during this pandemic when we've been laying off all, you know, 750 employees um, and trying to find a way to come back. Uh, Metro, as you know, is not uh, based on property tax. And so in a normal recession, we, we, don't, uh, we don't see much of an impact on our budgets, but uh, because we are part and parcel of the travel industry, because we are part and parcel of the waste industry and both industries are really struggling um, we have seen reductions in, in most of our budgets. So it, is, it has hit us uh, much harder because of that. So um, we, we want to be there and be a yes and for you, um, but just realize that we, it's gonna take some time to rebuild Metro up to be able to do everything that we want to, to help you with. Absolutely. Thank awesome. You. Well, with that, we'll uh, we'll adjourn. Let uh, our metro folks uh, enjoy the rest of their evening, or go on to your next meeting, potentially. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One Council. thing about 